Well, welcome to uh, week six here as we continue to uh, take a look at uh, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, and I, I certainly have been enjoying this chance to uh, dive a little bit deeper into these uh, uh, key uh, parts of our faith and what we believe. Uh, we've been comparing uh, the creed to uh, load-bearing walls, for example. These, these, uh, these walls that if you remove them in your home, uh, just as if you remove these things we, we confess in our faith, uh, there would be great collapse and, and you wouldn't have anything to, uh, to stand on. Uh, we also compared it last week to uh, vital organs and how uh, without your, uh, your heart or, or your brain, for example, you really, you can't, really can't uh, survive. Uh, and so if you, if you say that the resurrection is the heartbeat of our faith, I think it's safe to say that the ascension, as we look at that today, uh, kind of puts the legs on uh, the, the resurrection and the, the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, it, you know, when you think of your body, um, you need certain things to survive, but it sure is nice to have uh, a body exactly as God has given it, uh, to have uh, a body that functions in the way he intended it. And so well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive into uh, uh, the events of the Ascension as we celebrate Ascension Day, which falls 40 days after Easter, as uh, we heard that number 40 days uh, in our Acts 1 reading. And we're taking a look at this one simple part of the creed, that Jesus ascended into heaven. I want to start looking at that uh, by thinking of uh, uh, maybe an experience you've had in your life uh, of a time when, when maybe you were afraid of something, you were a little apprehensive about something, uh, but then uh, you got to that event, uh, you, you, you went through uh, whatever it is you were, you were afraid of, uh, and you found out, hey, it's, it's really not that bad. It actually turned out pretty good in the end. And my mind went to uh, actually a, a kind of a, a moment of truth, um, to when my wife told me that uh, uh, we were pregnant. Uh, and, you know, I had thought about being a, a dad before. I, you know, hadn't really considered it that uh, in depth. I, I thought kids were good, and I liked spending time with, with different kids that were in my life. But you know, I, I hadn't really considered it uh, being my own child and what that was going to look like in life. And so at first I was, I was, I was apprehensive. I was, I was unsure of how, how life would change. What, what was going to happen uh, when this, this child uh, was born? Turns out it wasn't actually that bad, right? It's pretty great, actually. It's not just not that bad. It's, it's pretty great. You probably didn't see it when he came up for a children's message. He had this big smile on his face. That'll just make you melt, right? Though I will say that there is still something to be said for, for grandparents who can just, you know, enjoy the kids and play with them and rile them up and then just give them back to the parents, right? I'll look forward to that someday too. But I think that, that idea of kind of being apprehensive about something but then finding out it really wasn't that bad is maybe the emotion that the disciples experienced at Jesus' ascension. Uh, the disciples, uh, it's safe to say from looking at Scripture, they, they, they initially dreaded Jesus leaving them. They, they, they had faith in this Jesus who, who was with them uh, and at all times, and they, they knew his power. They had seen him die and rise. In fact, uh, going back a little further, Peter even was, was a little uh, unsure about Jesus uh, dying, and he said he couldn't die. He said, Jesus, you will not surely die. So they were pretty unsure about what the future would hold. But from what we see and what we, we've read about the ascension, it, it actually wasn't that bad. It actually had a lot of wonderful things that came along with it. And this is where we see uh, Jesus ascend. The angels come to speak to the disciples as they, they stand in awe of what they've just witnessed. And the, the, the angels speak this promise that this same Jesus would return. And so that's why we're making that our theme today, that this same Jesus uh, will return, and that this same Jesus having ascended uh, has a lot uh, to do with our daily lives as well. And I think, I think the ascension is actually something that's often kind of glossed over a little bit, uh, that we don't take much time to really think about, and yet it has a lot uh, to say to our lives. In fact, I think you can say that without uh, the ascension, uh, we kind of wouldn't experience the effects of the crucifixion, of the resurrection, even of the incarnation of God becoming flesh. You could compare it to, to building a beautiful home for somebody and then never 
letting somebody actually move in and, and live in it, or, or cooking a, a grand meal for, for guests, for family, and then never letting somebody come over and actually enjoy all the work you've put into that. Another way you could put it too is that the crucifixion and the resurrection is the dynamite. It has the, the power within it. But the ascension is the detonator. It's what makes it all come to fruition. So that's exactly what we see if we look at uh, those words first of, of Luke 24. In fact, if you heard those words in my former book, Theophilus, and what we read from Acts, it's pointing us back to this because Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and Acts. So he's literally pointing us right back to these last words of Luke 24, where the disciples are basically going to the temple to worship and to witness. Once the, dis- the angels come, if we, we, we connect those two stories, they go to the temple and they are full of joy. They return to Jerusalem with great joy. It says they're continually in the temple as well. Now, why, why is that important? Why would they go to the temple? Why, why not just go home and, and wait for what is to come, wait for the promises of God to, to come true? Because the temple is where people were. It was there that they could share this crucified and risen Christ who their faith was in, that the devil had been defeated on the cross. And now they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. It connects us to to next week when we look at at, uh, the, the lines of the creed considering the Holy Spirit and we celebrate Pentecost in the church. There are exciting things happening with these disciples the disciples have, are coming to realize that Jesus' uh, ascension is not his absence from their lives, but it's instead this same Jesus ascending to heaven and yet having an intimate, never-ending presence in our hearts. He didn't become a ghost or, or dissolve into thin air. He didn't lose his, his earthly body that was crucified and rose again. No, he ascended as this same Jesus that the disciples know about, that we read about in Scripture. This same Jesus who is present in our world today and whose presence we get to experience and be a part of in our daily lives as well. That's partially because the Holy Spirit has entered our lives. I won't won't steal anything from next week when we look at that. But this gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that are given to us because Jesus has ascended has some great uh, impact in our lives. The first one being that we are witnesses as we live our daily lives. Now, many people think of witnessing as this kind of grand event of, you know, going overseas or going to another country, maybe even standing on a street corner or being some kind of televangelist or something and, and witnessing to tons of people at once. And that's good, but often witnessing begins much closer to home, much closer to how we just go through our daily lives. In fact, if we look at what Paul writes to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, the Thessalonian people were, were, there was many people in this, this church that actually thought Jesus would return in their lifetime. And so many of them had just become kind of idle, and they thought, well, let's just wait for Jesus to come back. And so Paul writes a, a, a different instruction to them. Paul writes, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. Lead a quiet life, he says. In other words, just do what you normally do. Live, do everything you do with your faith involved for your God. I was thinking about this and I thought of last week, there's all that construction at the, the other end of town and I was, I was driving through the Lowe's parking lot and somebody cut me off and I, I, I got pretty angry. And I thought, well, it's not really a, a way to live a, a quiet life, is it? To, to mind your own business, to do everything with your faith in mind, to do everything as a witness even. So what Paul is saying here is do everything you do the the best way you can. If you're a cabinet maker, make the best cabinets anybody has ever seen. 
If you restore cars or fix cars for a living, make them look awesome and run perfectly. If you're a doctor or a nurse or another kind of medical professional, care for people like nobody else does. In other words, no matter who you meet, make sure every person that you come in contact with sees why faith is important. And especially in a world where the pandemic has made a faith kind of an even more disposable thing, it's all the more important that our daily lives express why our faith is important and why Jesus' ascension matters and that he's sent his Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. But we're not left there either. We're not left to just be busy about God's work and, and kind of, uh, you know, hope for the best. In the meantime, uh, this same Jesus is also our advocate. I think that might be one of the, the coolest effects of Jesus' ascension. That's why uh, we read Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And if you reflect on, on your life, I think you'll, you'll find that there are so many times that the devil tries to come in and tempt us or to cut us down, to convict us for different things that we've done in the past. Gloves to say, hey, you remember that one thing you did? Remember Lowe's last week and how you treated that person? And yet we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven. In other words, he sits at the right hand of the Father. Jesus sits in the place of honor and power and influence. That's who is our advocate it's kind of like having an agent or an attorney at your, your disposal, ready to defend you against whatever attacks or accusations may come. By ascending, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and says, what do you need? He empathizes with us even. It says we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. In other words, we have one who has been tempted in every way, who has experienced every single thing we could possibly experience in our lives. And so if the devil's attacking you, Jesus says, I'll defend you. I'll defend you against those accusations and attacks. If you're struggling with something, I'll take care of it. Bring it to me. Or if you feel like nobody understands what you're going through, if, if you feel like uh, you, what you're going through is, is, is unique and, and you could tell people, but they, they really wouldn't get it, Jesus understands you better than anybody else. He understands how you think, what makes you tick, what makes you make certain decisions, and he is there to be your representative, your advocate. In fact, we sang a, a bit of a Newark Wren collective song during communion there that I think puts this so well. The chorus goes like this. Oh, you are my righteousness. You, Jesus, rush to my defense. You are my advocate, how you fight for me. And oh, you've never failed me yet. Your promises are yes. You are my advocate, how you fight for me, Lord. But it doesn't stop there either. We're, we're, we, we don't just have this high priest, this advocate who sits at the right hand of the Father, but Hebrews 4 goes on to say that we can then approach God's throne with confidence. We can approach the throne of God himself, our all-powerful, all-knowing God, with confidence. I don't know if you've ever had uh, things going on in, in your life, even if it's something absolutely the tiniest thing, and, you, and you, you, you think about praying to God and telling him about that thing, and yet you feel like that's so trivial. People are going through so many worse things than me. Why should I bother God with that? I know this past week we were doing some painting, and I, I at one point said a prayer, something like, God, help us to do a good job with this and not get burnt out by all the painting we need to do. Now, that might seem trivial, and I kind of thought it was a little bit trivial, but that's what that means, that we can approach God's throne with confidence. Jesus is basically saying, this is why I ascended, to be your advocate, to be your helper, to be there in your time of need, to give us mercy and grace. 
But it doesn't stop there either. We're not just stuck on this earth with an advocate in heaven. The promise is there too. Because Jesus ascended, he will also return. Jesus won't leave us stuck in this, same, in this sinful world. And that's the final promise of this same Jesus. That this same Jesus will return. Return in the exact same way that he ascended. We don't know the day. We don't know the time. That doesn't matter either. What matters is because he will come, and he will come as the same Jesus we know and love and worship, you can't miss it. You don't need to turn on the TV and wait for the headline to tell you what's going on. You don't need to go search the world for Jesus when he comes back. This same Jesus will return in a way that we will know beyond all doubt. And sin won't be allowed anymore. The judgment will come and the blood of Jesus will cover us. We will stand before God and he will bring us into the new heavens and the new earth. In fact, this second coming of Jesus is such an incredible and powerful thing to understand in Scripture that uh, as as one scholar counted it, there are 1,845 prophecies about the second coming of Jesus. That's eight times as many as there are prophecies about Christmas. And those all came true already. And so it's, it's a certain thing. It's a sure thing of our faith that this same Jesus will come back. This same Jesus is coming soon to a world near you. So all we can really say is that in all of these things, it's all about this same Jesus. This same Jesus that we read about all throughout Scripture, this same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, who was laid in a manger, who stilled the sea with his voice, the same Jesus who multiplied loaves and fish, who pulled a fish out of the sea with a coin in its mouth, who raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, who brought Lazarus out from the tomb. This same Jesus who hung on a cross paying for the sins of the world and who rose out of the grave on Easter Sunday. This same Jesus Christ who ascended to glory with the disciples standing there in awe is exactly the same Jesus who will come again one day. And this is the same Jesus who we worship, who we witness about, and who continues to be our advocate in the meantime as well. Amen. Let's pray and thank him for these things. Dearest Jesus, uh, your your name is power. Uh, As uh, we consider uh, the the power that is in uh, not only your crucifixion and your resurrection, uh, but today your ascension to be our advocate at the right hand of God our Father. Uh, we praise you for uh, how, uh, how, what effect that, that uh, advocating has in our daily life. And uh, may you continue to give us hope uh, and excitement for the future as we look forward to the day that you return to uh, restore all things, to make uh, the heavens and the earth new, uh, and to uh, do away with sin uh, once and for all. Uh, we praise you and we look forward to these things as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.